In the annals of naval warfare, it can often be said that there were revolutionary moments, such as the Trireme, Ironclads, Dreadnoughts. But if one is objective about it, it can't really be denied that the biggest and most revolutionary change to naval warfare was the advent of the aircraft carrier. And while the British Empire was the first to adopt it, and the Americans the ones to perfect it, if one is being objective, the people responsible for the aircraft carrier becoming the primary striking arm of the fleet are the Imperial Japanese Naval Air Service. And until the disaster that befell them in June of 1942, they reigned supreme across the Pacific. And the lady we shall discuss today was their flagship. But before we can talk about her, like all things when discussing Japan, we need a history lesson. Japan is an island by the sea filled with volcanoes and it's beautiful. Buckle in guys, about to get real. When the world entered the age of discovery, or the age of colonial genocide, depending on who you ask, it was accompanied by a huge leap in the technology of seafaring. Navigation had vastly improved, while ships capable of venturing in the most treacherous of waters were beginning to come online in Europe's navies. And yet, across the great expanse of the Pacific, there was a nation blissfully unaware of these developments. Or rather, they were remaining willfully ignorant of them. The land of the rising sun was an isolated nation, a country sealed off from the world after its failed experiment in empire building. In 1592, under Shogun Toyotomi Hideyoshi, the Japanese had embarked on a naval invasion of Korea, only to be vanquished by the might of the Korean admiral Yi Sun Sin, who, with his technologically superior turtle ships and an overtly aggressive strategy, cut off the Japanese army on the Korean peninsula, raiding their supply ports and obliterating their fleets in horrifically one-sided decisive battles. Once again, turtles are ruining Japan. The mighty samurai, who won almost every battle they had fought, now realise that eating is kind of important to winning wars, as is equipment that works. And so, with their situation being what is uh, politely called suboptimal, they found themselves using the remaining shipping in their possessions still afloat to leave Korea as fast as possible. And there was much rejoicing. This crippling defeat forced Japan's leaders to lick their wounds and consider their options. When, in the wake of this disaster, a Japanese tradition began. Aggressive military regime change. A daimyo by the name of Tokugawa Ieyasu seized the role of shogun for himself, founding the Tokugawa shogunate and unifying Japan. Upon assuming power, he and his descendants seized privately owned swords to prevent rebellion. That sounds familiar froze social mobility in the entire country, and most importantly, forbade any foreign influence from corrupting their land, except for a small port in Kyushu, the southern island, which was very heavily regulated. All the while, executing any foreigners who entered illegally, as well as any Japanese who tried to leave. Behold, the Tokugawa, sealing off islands more effectively than Nigel Farage since 1633. Thus, Japan stagnated, locked away from the world, trapped in the 1600s. That was until the 8th of July, 1853, when into Tokyo Bay sailed Commodore Matthew Perry. Knock, knock. It's the United States, with huge boats, with guns, gunboats. No, not that guy, this guy. Of the United States Navy. He had been sent by the US Congress to establish diplomatic relations with the countries of Northeast Asia, the primary one being the Empire of Japan. His offer was simple. Open diplomatic relations, open the country, and adopt capitalism. Refuse, and we will establish a government who is more amenable to our requests by force. I am the not God King Supreme. My offer is this, blink and you'll miss it. Adopt capitalism. Or super die. Are 
you enacting a power fantasy? Yes. <sighs> Some things never change. The Japanese, of course, knew that refusal would be suicidal, as well as serve no purpose. What followed was the complete revolution of Japanese society, the restoration of the emperor as the head of state and direct ruler, the abolition of the samurai class as an entity but its lionization as an ideal, and most profoundly, the rise of the capitalist class from the old nobility. You may recognize their names, Mitsubishi, Toho, Nakajima, Nissan. Yeah, sound familiar? They're still there. And they formed a new aristocracy. In fact, Japan practically invented what would become known as the corporate aristocracy. Their title? The Zaibatsu. These capitalist aristocrats were all industrialists. The Japanese equivalent of Rockefeller, Ford, or J.P. Morgan. And they, like their American counterparts, worked something out. They had learned the 34th rule of acquisition. And as the 34th rule of acquisition states, peace is good for business. That's the 35th rule. Oh, you're right. What's the 34th? War is good for business. It's easy to get them confused. In any case, having your sovereign be called an emperor without having an empire makes you look kind of dumb, so fixing this was probably a priority anyway. And so, the heavy industries of Japan were mobilized for expansion, and the main focus of their efforts was the ability to compete with the European powers. In the minds of the Japanese, this went back to how they were forced out of their isolation. Their invasion of Korea failed due to being outclassed at sea, and they had been forced to modernize by naval power and global trade. The only way to secure their plans for empire, therefore, was to dominate these two areas. To this end, they allied themselves with the world's premier naval power, Great Britain, modelling their fleet after the Royal Navy. With the world's greatest naval role model at their side, they would go on to defeat the Russian Empire in 1905, which, if the crew of the Russian ship Kamchatka is to be believed, was achieved by developing trans-dimensional teleport technology, allowing the Imperial Japanese Navy to deploy torpedo boats in the North Sea. But in actuality, they won the war at the Battle of the Tsushima Strait, with superior training and tactics combined with a shockingly bad Russian Navy. Except for Aurora. Aurora best girl. Anyway, moving on. As a bonus, they also scored the right to seize German Pacific colonies in 1918 in the aftermath of World War I, as due to their aforementioned alliance with Britain, they had joined the Allies. Ooh, go team. But... The Japanese, like most Asian cultures, have very long memories. They never forgot who it was that leveled a knife at their throats. And now, since Teddy Roosevelt's Great White Fleet, their victories over Spain, and the recent victory in World War I, the US Navy reigned across the Pacific as though it were theirs. The Naval High Command of Imperial Japan were firm in their conviction. This state of affairs must change. And they were the ones who were going to change it. You know what I'm going to have to keep covering in this series, guys? The Washington Naval Treaty. Only this time I get to talk about how one country decided, in the immortal words of the internet, Fuck this shit, I'm out. <laughs> Although, they didn't do that initially. In fact, Japan attempted to stick within the guidelines as set by the treaty. But in doing so, it split the navy into two distinct camps. First of them was the fleet faction, made up of officers who felt that the treaty was an affront to Japan's honour, and that it should be rejected out of hand in favour of rearmament to the highest degree, in order to wrest control of the seas from Britain and the United States. The other was the treaty faction, who believed that they should pursue peace with Britain and the United States due to the fact that a war with one or both superpowers would be a fight that Japan could not win, given its industrial and technological limitations. People think that Germany during World War II was factional and borderline dysfunctional, which it was, let's not get that twisted, it was, but I gotta tell ya, they ain't got nothing on Imperial Japan. If you ask a Japanese naval officer during World War II who his worst enemy is, he won't say the US Navy, he'll say the Japanese Army. 
and it won't be an exaggeration or an ironic remark either. This rivalry has its roots earlier in the Meiji period, during the foundation of the two services, but it really heated up in the 1930s when the decision was being made on the primary strategy for Japan going into the 1940s. It was a decision of whether they should secure the oil and metal reserves in Siberia, which would give the army strategic priority, or to go south and secure a Pacific empire for rubber and oil in the Dutch East Indies. That would of course give the navy primacy. This means, naturally, that both services competed and disagreed on literally everything. And this gets worse because it then breaks down into each faction inside the major branches. China focused army, Soviet Union focused army, fleet faction navy, treaty faction navy, forward defense generals, defense in depth generals, battleship admirals and carrier admirals. These are all real factions in the Japanese military and none of them worked well together. Even today, to say that Japanese culture has an issue with pride and status and rank over competence would be an understatement and a half. And the egos at play here were apocalyptically huge. More on that later though. But in fairness, the Washington and London Naval Treaties were decidedly unfair treaties regarding how they treated Japan. That must be acknowledged, because despite having an empire that covers the largest ocean on Earth, as well as being an island nation reliant on international trade, the Japanese Navy was restricted to well below the size of the British and US navies. Honestly, they got shafted, and the Japanese were rightfully angry about it. Mind you, it is literally the only thing they have a right to be mad about as far as World War II is concerned. Anyway. The signing of the treaty seriously dented Japan's further plans for expansion, at least until they decided to denounce it later on. Honestly, Japan's adventures dealing with this treaty is most accurately described as a saga. Fran Shushu for life. But in all seriousness, the hoops they went through, as well as the violations they committed, the creative designs and the colossal subterfuge, it's a wild f***ing ride. One that I really don't have time to do justice without compromising on the story of our main ship and her adventures. Suffice to say, there was some cheating going on, as well as some clever engineering. And, speaking of clever engineering, it's time to talk about what would become Japan's second ever aircraft carrier and their very first fleet carrier. In fact, one could argue that with her complement and size, she was the very first true fleet carrier to ever be commissioned. Let us go on a journey and tell the tale of the ship who fired the first shot in what would become the largest naval campaign in human history. This is the story of the Imperial Japanese Navy aircraft carrier, Akagi. After the early years of aircraft development matured into an actual science, military authorities began to take notice, and the Navy was absolutely no exception. Naval aviation was pioneered with hot air balloons and seaplanes by all the world's great powers during the early 20th century. But the honour of the first ever combat use of naval air power belongs to the Imperial Japanese Navy cruiser Wakamiya, whose aircraft struck the Austro-Hungarian and German ships in the port of Tsingtao on the 6th of September 1914. Granted, this naval attack was a failure and they missed, but points for effort. Throughout World War I, aviation expanded drastically, with the Royal Navy taking an active role in developing naval aviation. Being their allies, the Japanese paid close attention to these developments, with an eye to adapting them for their own navy. What resulted was an epiphany. Japanese naval theorists very early on took the view that when faced with vast distances of open ocean like the Pacific, aircraft will be absolutely vital for any future operations, and as such, a faction within the Japanese navy became dedicated to the creation and refinement of a naval air arm, with purpose-built aircraft carriers to provide a mobile strike group able to both force and win a decisive battle. To that end, the Japanese built the world's first dedicated aircraft carrier, the Horsho, which translates into English as the Flying Phoenix. 
Using this aircraft carrier as a bedrock, the Japanese Naval Air Service slowly began developing the operational concept of carrier aviation, as well as training the pilots, officers and crew needed to carry them out. However, as those familiar with Japanese culture would know, due to the country's history of isolation and a rigorous enforcement of social hierarchies, hence the various pronouns they use such as san, sama, hime, senpai, sensei, etc., if there is one word to describe Japanese institutions of any sort, especially state ones, that word is conservative. And in the case of the military, radically conservative. Like in all the world's navies at the time, the main focus was battleships. Only a small crop of military thinkers had the foresight to acknowledge aviation as the way forward for naval warfare. And due to the previously mentioned tendency to conservatism, the senior Japanese naval hierarchy was almost exclusively made up of surface fleet proponents. And so, when the Washington Naval Treaty was signed, limiting tummage limits to future vessels, it came as no surprise to anyone that almost all of the fleet faction admirals opposing the treaty were part of the battleship mafia. Or rather, I guess in this case it's the battleship Yakuza. One of the leading figures in this fleet faction was a man who had cut his teeth as a junior officer on battleships during World War I, and whose first command was a destroyer near the end of the war in 1917. He saw very little combat and was quickly put on the fast track to staff officer rank which gave him strong political credentials as well as seniority above his station, not to mention choice postings for the best commands. He was firmly a battleship man, big guns for a big fleet, a man with friends in high places and the rank to go with it, a rank that he probably didn't deserve. His name was Chuichi Nagomo, and he would indirectly play a role in both the birth of Akagi and be directly responsible for her death. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. The origins of what would become Japan's flagship carrier of the Kido Butai are in that of the Japanese Navy's expansion plans laid out at the turn of the century. After winning the Russo-Japanese War, the country was bankrupt, quite frankly, and further naval expansion was deemed too expensive. However, when the Royal Navy launched HMS Dreadnought, it became apparent that new surface ships would be required. A lot of complex politicking took place, but the long and short of it was that Japan wanted to have a fleet of eight battleships and eight battlecruisers, all under 10 years old, by the mid-twenties. However, with the aforementioned Russo-Japanese War, and since then World War I, Japan simply could not afford such an expense. But the officers of what would later become, said battleship Yakuza of the fleet faction, did not give up their lobbying and, to be blunt, they did a bit of uh, military strong arming. When talking about military coups in Japan's modern history, it's a very telling fact that you have to actually ask which one. And you can probably guess how that went. A compromise was therefore reached. A policy of eight battleships and four battlecruisers would be adopted. The battleships are famous, as we all know. Nagato, Kongo, Issei, Fuzo, and all of their sisters were built according to this plan, some of which built in Britain, while others were built domestically, with the result that a third of Japan's budget, a third of their GDP, was spent on the Navy. However, at the time, the battle cruisers were only just being laid down when the approval came through, and hence they were the last in line. They would, like their sisters in the Congo class, be named after famous Japanese mountains, the lead ship of which would be named Amagi. Yeah, you bitch, I got you right where I f***ing want you. Freaking tasteless, useless. Yeah, we're gonna let OC rage for a few minutes. While he's doing that, I'm gonna point out probably the most interesting thing about Amagi, and that is the naming of the class after her. Like with USS New York versus USS Texas, despite being the namesake, she wasn't actually the first in her class to be laid down. No. The first in the class of Amagi class battlecruisers was named after a volcanic mountain which would later become the inspiration for the most hated early level of the first generation Pokemon games. I still hate Mount Moon, it's still f***ing annoying, I will die on this hill. 
The first ship laid down was named for Mount Red Castle. In Japanese, Mount Akagi. Her design was pretty average for most battle cruisers at the time, but her armament was something rather impressive when you look at the statistics of it. 10 16 inch L45 naval guns as a primary battery, 16 5.5 inch guns as a secondary battery, and two sets of four torpedo tubes mounted either side, which would almost certainly have been fitted to launch the dreaded Type 93 Long Lance torpedo. The armor, meanwhile, had a 10 inch belt. And while the deck came in at around 3.7 inches, and the turrets at 11 inches. Let's be honest, it had stopped destroyers and cruisers, but that's about it. The torpedo protection, though, was pretty good. But like most battle cruisers, she was built for speed and maneuverability, not to slog it out like a ship of the line, so this is all to be expected. Overall, she was a very well-armed, decently armoured, and very fast battle cruiser, as designed. The keel for this wonderful ship known as Akagi, was laid down in a delicious piece of foreshadowing on the 6th of December, 1920, and construction work began on her hull. After a year of construction, the ship was looking good. The bow had taken on its sleek battlecruiser form, and the armour plates were being fabricated in readiness for fitting, and then it all came to a screeching halt. Japan signed the Washington Naval Treaty. There was fury and outrage in the Navy, as mentioned before, but due to the geopolitical situation as well as financial concerns, Japan had to adhere to the treaty stipulations. For now. And both Amagi-class ships were in violation of the new treaty agreements. However, there was a loophole. Due to the Americans wanting to convert Lexington and Saratoga, conversion of heavy battlecruisers to fleet carriers was permitted, and thus, like the United States, two vessels in Japan's construction queue would be selected for conversion. These would of course be the two partially finished battlecruisers, Amagi and Akagi. Because of this arrangement, one of the few exceptions to Japanese naming conventions occurred, as despite being aircraft carriers, they would keep their names as mountains, an honour which would end up being unique. The guns for the ships were placed in reserve and conversion to carriers slated to begin, when on September 1st, 1923, one of the worst earthquakes to ever hit Japan laid waste to the entire Kanto region. And this included the naval yard, which housed the incomplete hull of Amagi, which was now wrecked beyond any reasonable repair. Thus, Amagi was scrapped, and a replacement carrier conversion would be required. The replacement in question would be one of the battleships formerly under construction and named after one of Japan's most famous provinces. The incomplete battleship Kaga was ordered to be converted into an aircraft carrier, laying the foundations for a partnership that would become infamous the world over. On the 19th of November 1923, construction restarted and given her ancestry as a battlecruiser, Akagi took to carrier conversion very well. The original design for Amagi gave Akagi 19 very large oil and coal fired boilers powering four geared steam turbines generating a considerable 99,000 kilowatts of power. The reason of course for all this grunt was the fact that it was expected to be used to propel a big heavy battlecruiser at high speed. But the cool thing about aircraft carriers is, despite their physically larger size they are nowhere near as heavy as they are not as heavily armoured which means that Akagi was capable of getting up to 32.5 knots. For those unfamiliar with carrier operations, this speed is a big f***ing deal, because A, if we run into trouble, such as surface raiders, submarines, or air attack, we can either run away or maneuver very aggressively, improving survivability of the ship. And B, the faster you are going into the wind, the more passive airspeed you can generate for launching aircraft, and the easier it is to recover them, making air operations safer and more efficient. In her initial configuration, she was 857 feet long and 101 feet wide, with a displacement of 35,000 tons and a crew of 1,600. However, this isn't as interesting as her flight deck configuration. Check this sh out. Akagi's original layout had three flight decks. 
The top deck was 624 feet long and 100 feet wide, with a slight incline from amidships both fore and aft to assist in launch and recovery. The top deck was used for all recoveries and for heavily laden aircraft to launch, while the middle and lower decks were used for exclusively launch operations for obvious reasons. Although the middle deck was kind of useless as it was only 50 feet long and thus too short for anything other than the lightest aircraft to hit takeoff speed from. Which is disconcerting as these are interwar biplanes which have short takeoff rolls as it is. They also had nowhere to stick an island or funnel, so they stuck two funnels along the starboard side of the ship, one venting downwards towards the ocean, one venting vertically at the end of the flight deck, while the bridge was positioned behind the middle flight deck. The hangar space, meanwhile, for Akagi was very impressive when you consider when she was built. There were two main hangar decks, and a third auxiliary hangar used for storing spares and partially assembled aircraft. The two main hangars were 81,000 square feet in size and could store up to 60 aircraft, which are carried to the flight decks by two aircraft elevators, one forward and one aft. The forward elevator was offset slightly to the starboard, and the aft elevator was mounted along the center line. The reason for this is that the forward elevator serviced the lower and middle deck, and thus had to work around all the various machinery spaces, compartments, and aviation fuel tanks, which housed 150,000 gallons of very important, but very flammable, liquid. While the aft elevator serviced the main flight deck and could just go straight up from the hangars. Now, while this three deck configuration looks really cool and unique, as well as allowing for a simultaneous launch and recovery cycle, in practice, this sh** would be an Airboss's nightmare in terms of logistics and traffic control. I couldn't imagine trying to run three decks. I have trouble running just one. Three decks, launch and recovery at different intervals, which in of itself is not a good idea due to wind and airspeed variation depending on whether you're with the wind or against it. Like, this, this doesn't make sense. It looks cool though. The other problem was, uh, the arresting gear. The arresting gear was... British, old, and to be honest, a bit shit, relying on friction between the wires and the arrestor hook. In fact, it was so shit that the Japanese replaced the arresting gear on Akagi not once, but twice over her service life due to struggles with both the original design and the subsequent domestic Japanese design. But at least the Japanese designed arresting gear, you know, worked. Hey, I heard those air quotes, you son of a bitch. Unfortunately, the same could not really be said for the defensive armament. Akagi's early design had two turrets mounting twin 8-inch guns. Cruiser guns, in other words. The idea being that if she ran into trouble, she could uh, potentially fight off attacking surface raiders. But given that her armor scheme had been drastically reduced due to her carrier transition, this idea is in retrospect incredibly stupid, taking up valuable deck and munition space. She also mounted 12 5 inch guns in the anti air roll, mounted in six twin batteries along either side of the deck. Again, in retrospect, we have to be honest here, they would have been quite useless. Not that subsequent Japanese anti aircraft guns would prove any more effective. In fact, the only defensive measure that could be considered useful was the increase in torpedo protection. But in any case, in their defense, it should be noted that carrier doctrine was still being developed at this time and the concept of carrier battle groups was not widely accepted practice by any navy at this time. And the only way to develop doctrine, ladies and gentlemen, is to train with the new equipment. To that end, with her complement of 28 Mitsubishi B1M3 torpedo bombers, 16 Nakajima A1 fighters, and 16 Mitsubishi 2MR recon aircraft, Akagi was commissioned on March 25th, 1927, setting sail to conduct sea trials and experimental air operations as Japan's first ever fleet class carrier. Her sea trials went smoothly. She set records for her speed as well as refining the complex air operations inherent to her three deck design and thus she joined the combined fleet in August of 1927. However, her initial career was nothing glamorous. That said, she took her place as the flagship of Carrier Division 1, and served in almost all the fleet exercises of the period, 
her crew distinguishing themselves as one of, if not the finest crew in the Japanese Navy. But it was not the ship or its crew that this period of Akagi's career is famous for. It was her captain. On the 10th of December 1928, just one year into Akagi's life, a senior officer on his way up to the top took command of 1st Carrier Division's flagship. He had transferred from the cruiser Isuzu after recognising the war-winning potential of naval aviation, and he was eager to get first-hand experience. This was a man hailing from the city of Nagaoka. He was a humorous man. He liked shogi. He liked a drink. He liked the company of geisha. And most of all, he loved to gamble. He lived his life on the edge, having glimpsed death at a young age during the Battle of Tsushima when he lost two of the fingers on his left hand. He had obviously decided that life was too short to not have fun. In fact, he had developed a reputation, tearing up the bars and gambling dens in America while studying at Harvard. And that was during the onset of Prohibition. You can imagine how much of a mad lad this guy was. He learned to speak fluent English working as the naval attaché in the US, while learning as much as he could from their business and industrial practices. He was the protégé of Admiral Takechi Hori, the man who would lead the treaty faction of the Navy. And it was he who would foster some of the finest naval aviation officers Japan would ever produce. Two of those men being Tamon Yamaguchi and Minoru Genda. But what he is most well known for is being the vocal proponent of peace through strength in the Japanese Navy. A fierce and dedicated opponent to the alliance with Nazi Germany. And most of all, Japan's commander-in-chief of the combined fleet. This man's name is, of course, Isoroku Yamamoto. A name that deservedly goes down in history as one of the greatest naval officers to ever live. All I'm saying is there's a reason why we killed him. A more different man to Chuichi Nagamo you couldn't hope to find. And considering Nagamo would later get Yamamoto's mentor forcibly retired, their relations would be somewhat chilly. But all of that nonsense was ahead of him as he took command of Akagi. His tenure would only last for a year, but in that time he gained valuable experience, as well as refining 1st Carrier Division into a well-oiled force projection machine. However, the thought processes of the world's navies was in the process of change at this time. The Japanese originally planned to have the carrier forces support the battleships by sinking the enemy surface fleet as part of a traditional decisive battle doctrine. However, new lines of thinking began to emerge. Destroying enemy carriers should be the top priority, as that would then achieve aerial superiority for your side, thereby securing the ability to strike the enemy fleet without fear of retaliation. After all, what's the point of having a massive navy if you can't club baby seals with it? However, to do this, it became imperative that their carriers be the first to strike with a massive concentrated air assault, which meant that Japanese carriers operated ahead of the main force or alongside it making all possible speed while launching the attack from as far away as possible. There was an issue, though. Newer and more powerful aircraft would be needed to truly make this doctrine work. These aircraft would naturally have to be larger monoplanes with big engines and extended range fuel tanks. In short, the new planes would be heavier. And with three flight deck configurations, both Akagi and Kaga would not be able to support these new types. A refit would be required to accommodate them. And so, on the 15th of November 1935, Akagi pulled into the port at Sasebo Naval Arsenal to be thoroughly modernised, as well as to receive a massive overhaul. First change on the list was, of course, the flight deck. It would have to be extended along with the length of the ship to give the new aircraft a long enough runway. Akagi's two lower decks were removed, while the upper deck was extended to 818 feet in length. By removing the lower two decks, the hangar space was also increased to 93,000 square feet from 81,000 square feet, raising the aircraft complement to 61 active aircraft and 25 in reserve. They also finally fixed the arrestor gear with a hydraulic system supporting nine wires in total. 
This girl has got wires for days, my friends. As well as adding an island superstructure to better coordinate air operations. This island was also rather unique in carrier history, as like her sister Hiryu, Akagi had her island on the port side of the ship. The idea being an experiment to check if moving the control tower away from the funnels made flight operations more efficient. Speaking of the funnels, both the primary and auxiliary funnel were consolidated into a single unit, and the boilers were replaced with more modern fuel oil only systems. To compensate for this, her fuel storage for both aircraft and the ship itself were expanded, improving endurance at the cost of displacement. Akagi slowed down to 31 knots as she now weighed 42,000 tons. Now this girl be thick. But this was still well within optimal flight operation speed. However, again, not everything went so well. Like always, anti-aircraft defences suffered. Akagi's main gun battery on the foredeck was removed. Same for six of the 5-inch guns. They were replaced by 14 25mm Type 96 AA guns, which is great if they were actually good. But any of you who have watched Drakinifel's videos dealing with Japanese AA on ships would know what I'm going to say next. These guns were shite. Like proper shite. They are a rapid fire AA gun with 15 round magazines, meaning they have to be reloaded constantly, dropping their actual fire rate to around 110 rounds a minute. Or 180 if your gun crews are snorting Colombian Bam Bam like it's going out of style. How the fuck else would you do this job? Cocaine and hookers, my friend. And even then, they're shooting at something going at speeds in excess of 300 miles an hour in a dive. Which, if you've only got 110 or 180 rounds a minute, is fucking pathetic. And, speaking of pathetic design decisions, these AA guns were not mounted on the main deck, but rather in sponsons on the hangar deck meaning they couldn't traverse upwards enough to engage dive bombers properly, while the guns on the port side were even more restricted by being unable to engage due to the tower blocking their field of fire. Although, given what happens later, shooting your admiral would probably come in handy, considering. The firing directors for the guns, meanwhile, were inferior in quality to most other contemporary units, and most damning of all, both Akagi and her escorts were lacking in air search radar, meaning their early warning was their fighter cap and their lookouts, who, however you cut it, give you only about two minutes of warning. Because look, I'm Stevie Wonder, blind as a motherfucker. As for everything else, while well, Akagi's design as a battle cruiser did help in her belt and torpedo protection, but her flight deck, like most other carriers at the time, was almost completely unprotected. Her hangar decks were completely enclosed, meaning that firefighting in them would be a nightmare, while the aviation fuel tanks were welded into the structure of the ship itself, meaning that if the hull were compromised in any way, the fuel tanks would crack and rupture, spilling fuel into the hangar bay. When you combine that with the Japanese doctrine of deck load strikes, i.e. the flight deck launches one wave while the others rearm below decks, that inevitably means you have an enclosed space full of high explosives and aviation fuel in between launch and recovery cycles. But that's fine. We would have wiped out the enemy with our initial strike, and standard operating procedure is to have a reserve of bombers on standby and a rotating combat air patrol. So as long as we follow doctrine, no issues. Foreshadowing? Not at all. The rising sun causes shadows. It doesn't have any shadows, silly. We bathe in the Emperor's light, the heavenly sovereign that guards us from the filthy Xeno, I mean, Yankee imperialists. I scum of no prisoners for the Emperor! And I... All these changes to Akagi were finished on the 31st of August, 1938, with sea trials conducted to retrain the crews and shake down the ship. She was now ready for action a modern fleet carrier with an air wing comprised of the latest Japanese aircraft, the A5M Claude, the B4Y Jean, and the D1A Suzy. However, rumours abounded that these were only stopgap aircraft, and that new ones were being developed. But there was no time to waste. After the Kwantung army in Manchuria decided that they were the emperor now, Japan was at war with China and all military assets able to assist were being directed to support the continued advance by the Japanese army. 
Akagi, along with her sisters in 1st and 2nd Carrier Division, set sail to support their army colleagues, with Akagi's first deployment being in January 1939 and her second in March 1940. During this time, many lessons were learned in the conducting of carrier operations against land targets. Japanese experiences in China showed that individual raids by carriers were ineffective against most targets, land or naval, as not enough aircraft could be sent to have both an acceptable survivability rate as well as inflicting enough damage on the target. Furthermore, the delay between attacks could prove fatal to the attacker unless pressure was kept up to keep the enemy off balance throughout the battle, which meant that a huge initial attack wave would run out of steam and then you have to wait until the entire air group is recovered and rearmed before striking again, which leaves you vulnerable, as well as hampering reinforcement of the combat air patrol. Thus, two major doctrinal policies were adopted. The first was the deck load strike. The flight deck would have half the air wing ready to go for the initial attack. This wave would launch. Once this launch cycle was completed, the second wave containing the other half of the air group would be brought on deck and prepped for launch. Once the initial attack was completed, the second group would launch while the first wave returns to base. That way, you are essentially doing the naval equivalent of the one-two punch. The enemy can't react and hit you back because he's too busy trying to fend you off. The only problem is, if you're doing this with only one carrier, your strike force is only 30 or so planes, with light bomb loads as they are strike aircraft from aircraft carriers and not heavy bombers. The amount of ordnance that you can lob at the enemy would be far below what is necessary to deliver a knockout blow. You may as well be pissing on a bushfire, as we say down here in Australia. But what if you had all your carriers together in some kind of strike force? A strike force of ships to do the sinking while at sea, some sort of navy. A strike force or, in Japanese, a Akito Butai, if you will. Oh yeah, it's all coming together. Thus, on April 10th, 1941, the Japanese Naval High Command formed First Air Fleet, a revolution in naval aviation as it represents the first true aircraft carrier battle group. In this force was a truly terrifying assembly of firepower. The First, Second and Fifth Carrier Divisions all merged together. Akagi, Kaga, Hiryu, Soryu, Shokaku and Zuikaku. They formed a veritable instrument of apocalypse for anything they deemed non-essential for continued existence. And Japan would need it. Despite the protests of the naval staff and the furious lobbying of Admiral Yamamoto to the Imperial Council and Diet, Japan signed the tripartite pact with Nazi Germany, occupying Vietnam in the process. In response, the United States declared Japan persona non grata in the community of nations, partly due to wanton imperialist aggression, and partly by achieving something they never would. Thank you. Never loses a war. What's Saigon called? Sorry? What, what's Saigon called right about now? What's the city of Saigon called right now? Subjecting them to a trade embargo of all strategic materials, food, oil, and steel. Japan was reliant on imports for almost all of its rare metals, high-grade industrial supplies, and oil most of all. Losing these supplies put the Japanese in an untenable position. To continue the war in China, as well as maintain their naval deterrent, the Japanese needed oil. And with the US ceasing exports, it left them with one option. Taking the fuel reserves in the Dutch East Indies. But that would involve, of course, seizing the Philippines and Malaya, to secure their main supply route back to the home islands, which ultimately means war with both the US and Great Britain, the two largest naval and economic powers in the world. Now a smart man would look for a compromise, work out a deal. We give you anime, in return you don't erase us from existence. But remember what I said about Ego? Yeah, the Japanese weren't going to back down. So war it was. It was going to happen. It was unavoidable at this point. And if this undertaking was to have any chance of success, the United States must be critically weakened prior to taking action. Failure to do so would force Japan into conflict with an enemy of comparable strength, 
but simultaneously being able to outproduce and outman them by a factor of 10. Despite his opposition, Admiral Yamamoto was tasked with the operational concept of defeating the US Navy at the outset of hostilities. To do this, he approached three men. Admiral Ryunosuke Kusaka, Captain Minoru Genda, Chief Planning Officer for First Air Fleet, and Mitsuo Fushida, Akagi's commander of the Air Group, or CAG for short. The plan was a bold one. Strike the US fleet at anchor with the goal of destroying the American carrier force. Secondary targets were the primary airfields and resupply depots, followed by the battleships. If we can hit those, we can delay the Americans long enough to secure a defensive position strong enough to hold out until we can negotiate terms. The go code for launching the attack would be climb Mount Nitaka. The target, US Naval Anchorage, Pearl Harbor. And the radio call for the attack to begin would be. On November 26th, 1941, the carriers of Kido Butai slipped out of their anchorage in the Kuril Islands on an easterly heading. A submarine squadron comprised of I-16, I-18, I-20, I-22, and I-24 had sailed the day prior to position midget submarines close to Oahu. The Japanese Navy was embarking on a daring mission at the edge of their operational range. The Northern Pacific is treacherous in winter, making replenishment at sea a hazardous exercise. Furthermore, they could not risk being spotted and thus had to navigate entirely across the open sea with all the difficulty that that entails. But Kido Butai was a truly fearsome force. The aviators were the best trained pilots in the world, and almost all of them had combat experience. Japanese pilot training was one of the most brutal and intense training regimes in history, let alone by World War II standard, with a failure rate higher than most special forces selection courses today. Saburo Sakai, the famous Navy ace, recounted his experiences in the book Samurai, which I highly recommend. But some of the stories he tells are flat out unbelievable, even by standards of the time. This high standard would later cause terrible issues in replacing losses later on. But at this time, there was no finer group of pilots, and they had new aircraft to carry out their mission. Kido Butai had been outfitted with the latest models of carrier aircraft, the B-5N Torpedo and Level Bomber, the D-3A Aichi Val Dive Bomber, and of course, the legendary Mitsubishi A6M Zero. With these new weapons, it would be the air group of the Imperial Japanese Navy ship Akagi leading the strike. The day came, the day that would live in infamy, on the morning of December 7th, 1941. Admiral Nagamo from the Bridge of Akagi raised the famous Z flag, which had proudly flown during their victory at the Battle of Tsushima. He had relayed the message climb Mount Nitaka, and was now signalling to commence launch operations. Captain Mitsuo Fushida had arranged Akagi's aircraft on deck, fully armed and ready. And as dawn broke, the first aircraft began their takeoff roll, and with Akagi's air group firmly in the lead, once all 177 Japanese planes had formed up, the first wave headed towards Pearl Harbor. The Americans at this time had already been alerted, however, but not to an aerial attack. USS Ward, patrolling the area around the mouth of the harbour, had sunk one of the Japanese midget submarines, reporting the action to Admiral Kimmel. However, due to the usual peacetime bureaucracy and the lack of warning for a potential attack, no alert was put out to the fleet or any of Pearl's defences. This continued when Akagi's air group appeared on the radar scopes at Opana Point followed by the rest of Kido Butai's air wing. However, it was dismissed as either a flight of B-17s from the mainland or a formation of SBDs returning to Pearl Harbor after their carrier's mission to Wake Island was finished. Due to security protocols, no strength numbers were advised for either of the possible flights. Cutting off their oil supplies, followed by a sub-attack, 
I mean, yeah, that's pretty ambiguous. It couldn't possibly be the Japanese. Surely not. At 7.48 a.m. local time, a faint radio call was picked up in the wireless room aboard Akagi. Several US aircraft were then immediately shot down by Akagi's fighters, one of which being a Dauntless, which radioed off a warning. But due to its radio conditions and the speed of the attack, warning was not received. Not that it mattered. The Japanese aircraft descended on Pearl Harbor, heading to find their targets. 90 B-5N Kates headed straight for Battleship Row and Carrier Point, looking for their targets. And there they were, the pride of the United States Navy, anchored neatly in a row. The torpedo bombers broke off and began their runs on the outer US ships, while the inboard US ships were targeted by the level bombers. The dive bombers and Zeros, meanwhile, blasted Pearl Harbor's airfields and dry docks, blasting ships anchored away from Battleship Row as they went. The sailors aboard the US ships awoke to find the sky filled with aircraft bearing the Hinomaru, the rising sun, and immediately sprung into action. But there was very little that they could do. In the span of minutes, most of Battleship Row was ablaze, with many men forced to abandon ship into the waters, rapidly filling with burning oil. And it was then that one of the B-5Ns from Hiryu's airgroup dropped its armor-piercing bombs on the forward section of USS Arizona. At 8.06 a.m., the battleship's magazine detonated, wiping out most of her crew and wounding countless others. However, her death was not in vain, as the explosion's shockwave blew out most of the fires aboard the repair ship USS Vestal, who would later on be essential in future operations. But that was the total extent of the luck the US sailors would have today, as suddenly overhead the 167 aircraft of Kido Butai's second wave arrived. They began to clean up the ships the first wave had missed, while the fighters swept across Oahu's air bases. Ship after ship went up in flames. USS Shaw was practically immolated while anchored alongside. Meanwhile, the various ground installations, including Sink Pack headquarters and the Navy Hospital, were bombed while almost every aircraft of all types and service on the island was strafed into oblivion. And then, 90 minutes after the attack had begun, the Japanese vanished, and an eerie calm fell across the harbour as fires burned, men screamed, and secondary explosions punctuated the ever-present sound of creaking steel as ships the proudest ships in the United States Navy capsized and sank. In that 90 minutes, the Americans had lost their entire Pacific battleship force, either damaged or sunk. Arizona, West Virginia, Nevada, Oklahoma, California, Tennessee, and Maryland were all out of commission. Pennsylvania was banged up, but could be gotten back into shape while three cruisers and four destroyers, including the destroyers Kassen and Downs, were also critically damaged. But as the chaos began to subside, it became apparent that the damage control teams of the US Navy knew their business far better than people gave them credit for. While they wouldn't be able to fight for a while, of all the ships attacked in Pearl Harbor, only two, Arizona and Oklahoma, were destroyed beyond repair. All the other ships would return to service before war's end, some of which within six months. I hope the Japanese take this into consideration and moderate their attitude to these constraints. Meanwhile, aboard Akagi, the mood among the crew and pilots was jubilant. They had dealt a crushing blow to the enemy and remained largely unscathed. True, they had lost a few aircraft and their submariner colleagues were having a rough day, but compared to the damage they had done to the Americans, that was nothing. Among the senior staff, however, things were not so cheerful. Admiral Yamamoto, who had been receiving constant reports about the progress of the battle, 
had received the worst news of his entire life up to this point. The American carrier force was not in port. They weren't there at the time of the attack on Pearl Harbor. His primary target was missing in action. And while they had done serious damage to the battleship force, these could easily be destroyed either by his air group or the new Yamato class battleships now available to combined fleet, as per their doctrine. Their destruction was simply to be the sweet dumplings after dinner, the dessert, a bonus to keep those idiots in the fleet faction happy. Their sinking without the carriers being destroyed also was nothing more than symbolic, and he was sure that it was going to bite them in the ass if they didn't make sinking the US carriers in battle their first priority. Unsurprisingly, Genda and Captain Fushida shared their sensei's concerns. After returning to base, both men approached Admiral Nagamo along with the other senior flight officers. Genda himself had advocated an invasion of Hawaii as part of the plan, but due to the difficulty of executing such an operation, this was dismissed. Fushida, meanwhile, knew the importance that the carriers held. Their absence meant his pilots and his ship were in immediate danger unless something was done to prevent their counterattack. Both men, along with the other five captains of Kido Butai and especially Tamon Yamaguchi aboard Hiryu, urged Admiral Nagamo to approve the planned third wave of attacks. One last great effort with the entire air group together will be sent to target the fleet infrastructure supporting US operations in the region. The fuel stores for the entire fleet, along with their repair yards and dry docks, not to mention follow-up attacks on now undamaged ships. With this final knockout blow, even if the enemy carriers return, they'd be unable to operate after the other Pacific bases are taken by Japanese troops. Those troops, meanwhile, were already en route to wake Guam and the Philippines. Given that his entire staff and all of his aviators, plus his captains and adjutants, recommended this follow-up attack to mitigate the future threat of US carriers as they hadn't been at anchor, Admiral Nagamo had one clear choice. And yet, he chose to retreat. Nagumo feared that as the US carriers had not been at anchor, that they could be nearby and launch a counterattack. Furthermore, it was the middle of the day, and a raid launch now ran the risk of forcing his pilots to land at night. And finally, most critical of all, was the shortage of fuel aboard ship. He had just enough to get home as it was. Pushing his stocks further would be a big gamble if anything went wrong. And so, over the protests of his entire air group and half his staff, including his captains, Admiral Nagumo ordered retreat. And in so doing, committed one of the greatest errors in naval history, starting the chain of events which would ultimately doom the ship on which he now stood. As while Akagi and Kirubutai turned west towards Japan, another ship was steaming eastwards into Pearl Harbor. Its crew was enraged. On this ship, two men stood on the starboard quarter, staring towards their home airfield. An airfield which was now ablaze. While the harbor tugs beside them were pulling men soaked in oil aboard, half dead with exhaustion, covered in burns. Wade McCluskey and Richard Best shared a look. A look which conveyed what every man on that ship felt. Those bastards are going to pay. And the price would be high. The Kido Butai set sail back to Japan in the highest of spirits. The greatest naval rival in the Pacific had been vanquished without so much as a scratch to themselves, and now they had an empire for the taking. Hiryu and Soryu detached after resupply to assist in the capture of Wake Island, while the rest of the fleet supported the invasion of Rabaul. These operations were completed rapidly and with overwhelming force allowing Kido Butai to return early to resupply. However, there was no time to waste. Due to their failure to find their carriers, the US Navy would almost certainly strike back in some fashion. And both Yamamoto and Nagumo knew 
They knew the Americans well enough to be sure that whatever they did, it would be aggressive. Especially due to the fact that Japan had, due to a breakdown in diplomatic communications or through intentional back-channel interference, they had attacked Pearl Harbor without a declaration of war. Something not calculated to leave a very good impression. And, as if you could set your fucking watch by it, suddenly, Americans. America, fuck yeah, come out again to save the motherfucking day, yeah, America, fuck yeah, freedom is the only way, yeah, terrorists, your game is blue. The US carriers, which had been absent from Pearl Harbor, now arrived in style raising hell through the Marshall Islands, shooting, bombing, and shelling with naval guns anything that had a Japanese flag on it. Kwajalein was especially hit hard, prompting an immediate response. Akagi, Kaga, and Zuikaku gave chase, searching the area for the intruders. However, the Americans were long gone by the time they had arrived. Their quarry gone, Akagi and her sisters returned to base. Zuikaku and Shokaku rearmed and refitted in preparations for a big operation, while Akagi, Kaga, and Hiryu and Soryu headed south to support the invasion of Java. When they arrived, it became apparent that the biggest threat to operations in this sector would be Allied naval forces sortieing from Australia. With that in mind, a raid was launched on the capital of Australia's Northern Territory, Darwin hitting the harbour in full force. 242 aircraft in total, including a force from land bases nearby. Us Aussies were caught completely by surprise, and carnage followed. 11 ships were sunk, 25 ships damaged, 3 ships forced aground, and an entire squadron of 30 aircraft wiped out. 236 dead, and 400 wounded. The harbour itself, meanwhile, was torn to shreds, with most of the fuel storage tanks being turned into a blazing inferno. The invasion of Java by Japanese forces was essentially a walkover, as all the reinforcements and supplies for the garrison were now either marooned or at the bottom of Darwin Harbour. The forces already at Java were likewise ambushed and blown to pieces by 1st and 2nd Carrier Division. Yet again, Japan's victories mounted, while their losses were minimal. But there still remained one issue. The British. Because of course, it's always the British, isn't it? The Royal Navy, despite being locked down in a struggle with the Germans over the Atlantic, and the Italians in the Mediterranean, still had a large naval presence in the Far East. Given that the Japanese were planning on taking Singapore, something had to be done about it. The first step took place on December 10th, just three days after the attack on Pearl Harbor when both Prince of Wales and Repulse were sunk by land-based bombers of the Japanese Naval Air Service. Given that these two ships represented the only real capital ship threat in the area, it was a severe blow to the Royal Navy forces in the Pacific, combined with the follow-on land invasions of Malaya and Singapore Island. The understrength and under-equipped British forces didn't stand a chance. Despite their concerted efforts to hold out, the defences for Singapore faced out to sea, after all, no one considered it possible that a nation with tons of experience in jungle fighting and soldiers acclimatized to the climate and terrain could launch an offensive and aggressive land invasion through the jungle. That apparently didn't occur to anyone. Anyway, the Japanese soldiers, though numerically inferior, were well-trained, well-equipped, and full of combat experience, and most of all, highly motivated. These boys knew their business, and after being decisively defeated, the British garrison surrendered to General Yamashita on February 15th, 1942. The British Bastion of the East had fallen to a numerically inferior force. The result was humiliation. The Japanese were on a roll, and it appeared absolutely nothing could stop them. But despite these stunning victories, Admiral Yamamoto remained circumspect as always. Whatever your opinions of the man, if there's one thing you can say about him, this guy never buys into the hype. He was concerned that there was still a substantial force based in the Indian Ocean, 
and if it was left unchecked, it could jeopardize upcoming operations in Malaya, New Guinea, and Burma. As such, it needed to be eliminated. And as always, it would be Akagi and Kido Butai who would do the job. On the 26th of March, the Japanese fleet put to sea, heading towards Sri Lanka. Kaga stayed behind, leaving them with five carriers instead of the full six. However, they did have the entire Congo class with them. Haruna, Hiei, Kirishima, and Congo herself. They were expecting to destroy the British Eastern Fleet in port. However, with a combination of strong British intelligence assets and American code breaking, the Japanese would not have the luxury of surprise this time. Admiral Somerville, yes, that's Somerville, having served with distinction in defeating Bismarck at the head of Force H, had been posted as commander of the Eastern Fleet, and he was not going to make the same mistake his colonial friends had made. But while it was accurate for the most part, the intelligence was a bit misleading in the terms of strength of numbers. He had been told only two Japanese carriers were in the force, not five, which, to put it mildly, is not cricket. And I can only imagine what his reaction to all of those battleships coming at him would have been. But carriers aside, he did have the stronger surface force, led by HMS Warspite. And with radar-equipped night bombers, the fairy Albacore, aboard Indomitable, Formidable, and Hermes, he hoped to use naval guerrilla tactics to peck away at Kido Butai, while minimising damage to his own fleet. Thus, he put to sea before the Japanese arrived. When they showed up to bomb Colombo, the capital of what was then called Ceylon, they would find only support vessels and older ships in port, not his fleet. And so it was the case. On April 5th, 1942, Kido Butai's first wave of attackers swept over Colombo Harbour and the RAF bases established to protect it. Three ships were sunk in the harbour, while several others were damaged, none of them part of Somerville's main force. However, the real blow was to British air power in the area. Over 30 aircraft were shot down, including a whole squadron of swordfish, which he would need in the upcoming engagements. And as though as the universe wanted to remind Somerville of home, when it rains, it pours. As per the Deckload Strike Doctrine, the second wave was getting ready to hit Colombo, when a recon aircraft from the heavy cruiser Tone sighted two British heavy cruisers nearby. Originally, the reserve force aboard Shokaku and Zoikaku were tasked to hit the two ships, but due to them being ordered to switch out ordnance from a different mission, they were delayed and unable to launch. On reflection, it's a mistake to order a weapon change mid-operation, even if the tactical circumstances change drastically. Thankfully, with this experience and the other reserve force ready to go, Nagamo definitely wouldn't repeat this mistake. Hiryu and Soryu launched their strike instead, and attacked the cruisers HMS Cornwall and yet another Bismarck veteran, HMS Dorsetshire. These cruisers had survived Atlantic storms and the U-boat menace and a battle with Germany's flagship. But it was apparent to all in the know. Air power was the future. Both cruisers were sent to the bottom almost immediately, with cold professional efficiency from the Japanese aviators. And with their mission complete, they immediately returned to base. They were convinced. The Brits weren't going to let them get away with that one easily. They had to move and get away before the counterattack came. However, the British were in disarray. Their search aircraft had attempted to pinpoint Kido Butai's location, only for them to be promptly eradicated by Akagi's combat air patrol. With night falling and neither side having sufficient intelligence, it was like two blindfolded drunks knife fighting in a multi-story car park. And now he mounts a big attack, a series of lightning fast kicks. Unfortunately, he is struggling with the concept of distance. Old mate is like, can you fuck off home? Stop talking, your breath bloody stinks. And as such, there was a lull in the fighting. As it stood at this point, it was 2-0 to Japan at halftime, and their lead striker Hiryu was lining up for a hat-trick. But weirdly enough, it was the surface raiders time to shine. The next day, Mogami-class cruisers Kumano and Suzuya sank a convoy of five merchant ships. Things looked like they were going well, but there was an issue forming. Japanese recon aircraft were not being fully utilised. 
Nagumo had no idea really where the British actually were. Nor, when he engaged the Albacore recon force, did he realise that the enemy carrier group was at sea and nearby. There were also the delays in rearming aircraft by flip-flopping on the command decisions to rearm. Despite being in command of Kido Butai at the outset, Nagumo's lack of knowledge regarding air operations was becoming apparent to those around him. That said, the skill of his staff and his pilots, as well as a large helping of luck, kept him in the game as Admiral Somerville was kept on the back foot. By April 9th, Akagi's air group led an attack on the port of Trincomalee, raising absolute hell in the process, blasting the airfield and sinking two ships in the harbour. But that wasn't going to be the real issue for the Royal Navy. During the attack on the airfield, Battleship Haruna had dispatched a recon aircraft to conduct battle damage assessments on the results of the attack, as well as scout out the surrounding area to see what was there. And who should they find but HMS Hermes and HMAS Vampire, attempting to elude detection. Nagamo ordered the reserve force of 80 Val dive bombers into the attack, led by a group from Akagi. They tracked in onto the small task force who had evacuated Trincomalee the night before, and commenced their attack run. Akagi and her sisters proved once again that their air groups were the best in the business. Hermes and Vampire were blasted apart on the first attack run, allowing the follow-on waves to hit four other nearby vessels, sinking them with the same brutal efficiency. But while this was happening, Nagumo received a rather alarming wake-up call. Due to all the attack operations being launched, he and his subordinate officers had not ensured a sufficient combat air patrol was in place, and what should appear but a force of nine insanely brave Blenheim crews from Number 11 Squadron RAF. These guys needed two engine bombers to carry their balls, because these men, like absolute gigachads, successfully evaded the roving Zero patrols and rolled up straight into the middle of Kido Butai, casually cruising through a hail of shrapnel and anti-aircraft fire, and they headed straight for Akagi. It was only by sheer seamanship and a little bit of luck that no damage was sustained, as through evasive manoeuvres and the winds at drop altitude, the Blenheims missed their target, and they lost five of their nine aircraft in the formation in the attempt. But it did the trick. It was this nerve-wracking near-miss, as well as the diminishing stockpiles of fuel and ordnance, that convinced Nagamo that he'd pushed his luck far enough. Once the strike on Hermes had been recovered, Kido Butai was ordered to retreat. Yet again, the Japanese Naval Air Service had done severe damage to an enemy with almost no losses to themselves. The score stood at 8 warships, 23 merchants, and 50 to 60 enemy aircraft destroyed, on top of severe damage to enemy port facilities. All of that for the loss of only 30 aircraft. It was an outstanding tactical victory. But a disturbing pattern was forming. Japanese doctrine had severe flaws, which had gone unaddressed due to the constant successes they had achieved. Furthermore, despite having planned all of these bold initiatives, Kido Butai's commander was now overly cautious, hesitant to make decisions, and too restricted by traditional battleship commander thinking. Not to mention having limited experience in aviation, it was only the skill of his aviators and his staff under him that the operations had gone as smoothly as they had. And once again, despite having the enemy on the back foot, cornered by a superior force and with a chance to get aggressive, Nagamo had backed off. Disengaging from the British, Kida Butai, with Akagi in the lead, began the long journey back to Japan. Round the Malayan Peninsula they went, heading through the Taiwan Strait. At least now, after we've secured all the surrounding territory, it will be a quiet trip. No air threats, no surface threats. It makes a nice change. I mean, we have to watch out for submarines, I guess, but it's just going to be a nice, relaxing cruise back to... Oh, is that... Oh, for God's sake...
hang on a minute, no. The British, here. We took Hong Kong. We took Singapore. We took Malaya. How is this even possible? What the hell's going on? How are the British here? Did you just call me fucking British? All oh, right. Sorry. Force of habit. I've done two episodes of this series now, and every time I do, there's an air raid. It's always the fucking Brit. Wait, Americans? America! Fuck yeah! Come out again to save the motherfucking day! Yeah, America! Fuck yeah! Freedom is the only way down! Terrorists, your game is through! Cause now you have to answer to America! Fuck yeah! So lick my blood and suck on my mouth! America! Fuck yeah! What you gonna do when we come for you now? Did... did they just... Bomb Tokyo? With medium bombers? Launched from aircraft car- Wow, okay. They're out of their goddamn minds. Consider our ass bitten. Fuck. Whew. Yamamoto's fears had been realized. His warnings had been unheeded. While the Doolittle Raid did absolutely minimal damage to Japan's industry and the daily operations of Tokyo as a city, the psychological damage was absolutely devastating. The Imperial Palace lies in the center of the city. Had the Americans been more exacting in their attack, the life of the Emperor could have been at risk. To the conservative monarchist Japanese, such an attack was unthinkable and unacceptable. Yamamoto was ignored no longer. The American carriers must be hunted and destroyed. Akagi was tasked with finding the Americans before leaving Japanese waters. However, they were still on the southern tip of Taiwan at the time, and there was no way they were going to catch the Americans before they got away. And yeah, the Americans got away easily, and the hunt was called off several days later. With Kido Butai returning to base on the 22nd of April, 1942. It was time for a rethink. But true to his character, Yamamoto had a plan in mind. And in his style, it was aggressive, bold, and a gamble. Force the Americans to open battle on their territory and defeat them in detail. It would involve a long transit and a pitched battle, followed by an elaborate trap. All the moving pieces had to work. But if it did, it would pave the way to the conquest of Hawaii and perhaps put Japan in the position to request terms. When the hammer fell, it would be on a small island halfway across the world's largest ocean. The admirals of both sides would order their carriers forward to a battlefield chosen tactically in advance, far from each country's shores. The fight that was coming would be a bomb-run day in the naval way, as a blood-red sun was on the rise. They would meet at Midway. Given the attack on Tokyo, as well as to secure their new territory, the Japanese High Command determined that to both cut off the Americans from their primary staging base in Australia, and to guard against further attacks on the home islands, the Pacific perimeter would need to be extended eastwards. This involved seizing the Aleutians, Operation AL, and the upcoming Operation to Take Midway, Operation MI, destroying the US carrier forces in the process. However, the Japanese army was decisively engaged in New Guinea, and if the US was allowed to stage in either Australia or the Solomons, the oil and rubber supplies in the Dutch East Indies would be in danger, not to mention the possibility of US forces taking bases, allowing for a strike on the home islands in force. To prevent this, New Guinea and American Samoa must be secured, and the only way to do that would be to prevent reinforcement and resupply of Allied forces currently operating in the area. Thus, Operation M.O. was born. 
The plan was a simple one, really. As far as Japanese plans go, anyway. Invade Port Moresby, cut off the Australian troops fighting on the Kokoda Trail, allowing for a defeat in detail. With New Guinea secured, operations to isolate Australia could begin once Operation MI had been successfully concluded. Yamamoto did approve of this plan, but he wasn't exactly happy about it because it spread his forces too thin, considering the two operations in the North Pacific scheduled to begin in June. But, given the circumstances, he was overruled from on high, and the strategic implications were both genuine and pressing. They couldn't ignore it. Wanting to preserve Kido Putai's strength, as well as to keep things running efficiently, the fastest and most modern carriers, Shokaku and Zuikaku, would be dispatched to support Operation MO. Hopefully, this hard-hitting force would achieve victory quickly and use their superior cruise speed to return for resupply in time to join in Operation MI. However, it was not to be. After a fierce fight with the Australians over the island of Tulagi, the Japanese invasion force ran head-on into Task Force 17. Admiral Takeo Takagi cursed to high heaven. He had suspected the Americans would oppose him, but their carrier force being all the way down here in the Solomons was not in the plans. Recon confirmed two fleet carriers, USS Yorktown and USS Lexington, complete with substantial surface units as escort. It was strange. Almost as though they knew Operation Emma was coming. Though the Japanese had a stronger force, but not the overwhelming superiority they had enjoyed previously. Nevertheless, it was time to take the offensive. What followed would be known in history as the Battle of the Coral Sea. And it was brutal. Both sides knew where each other was. Carrier Division 5 was led by Admiral Chuichi Hara, who, unlike Nagamo, had been trained in naval aviation operations during his cruiser days, as well as being attached to the combined naval aviation training units. And he was known for carrying his family sword with him aboard ship. This man embodied the samurai spirit of old, and if the Americans wanted a fight, he would definitely give them one. Across two days, the 7th and 8th of May 1942, the carrier equivalent of a slugfest took place. Move and counter move, jabs and uppercuts. I'll go into more detail when I tell the story of one of the main carriers that took part, but suffice to say it was a brutal battle with heavy losses on both sides. Japanese aircraft losses were far heavier than in any battle they had fought up to this point, and it was compounded when US aircraft obliterated the light carrier Shoho with a fusillade of 13 bombs and 7 torpedoes. However, the Americans also suffered a devastating blow. USS Lexington was hit by a veritable barrage of ordnance, starting fires which would eventually result in a catastrophic explosion dooming the ship. At the same time, USS Yorktown was crippled, unable to conduct flight operations after her deck was blown apart by Val dive bombers. It was looking like the Japanese had won the day, but the Americans kept up the pressure, while Australian land-based aircraft launched attacks on the invasion force. Both Shokaku and Zuikaku took damage themselves, and without support, as well as an opposed landing to contend with, the Japanese were forced to withdraw. Yes, they had done more damage tactically, but strategically, it was a defeat. Carrier Division 5 was now combat ineffective, Port Moresby remained in Allied hands, and now Operation MI would only have four carriers available to engage the Americans. However, there was some good news. Midway Island seemed to be having supply issues, and completely unaware of the impending attack. They had received some reports of reinforcement, but that was only normal considering that they had lost Wake Island. And intelligence assets had picked up transmissions suggesting that they had a fault with their water supply system, as well as some other shortages of ammunition and aircraft. It should be a simple matter to take the island. All they'd need to do is seize this target and the US carriers would be forced to attack them. And if they could be engaged decisively, especially having just lost Lexington and Yorktown, it would put Japan in a commanding position to defeat them in detail, turning the Pacific into a Japanese lake for the short-term future. 
allowing them to maybe, just maybe, pursue a diplomatic solution from a position of strength. As May turned into June, the bulk of the Japanese Navy put to sea for what was intended to be the legendary Kantai Kesen, the decisive battle. The final battle to decide the fate of the war, the fate of nations. The submarine and seaplane force took the lead as they fanned out ahead to pave the way and scout for the Americans should they be at sea. Yamamoto wasn't taking chances. As a precautionary measure, he ordered all carriers to have an anti-shipping reserve force on standby in case the enemy fleet was encountered before or during the operation's early phase. Even upon leaving port, they had to have that reserve ready. Behind the reconnaissance screen came Kido Butai itself, with Akagi in the lead. Strict radio silence enforced to ensure detection was impossible unless sighted visually. Her aircraft were primed and ready for action. However, these aircraft and their crews had been on constant operation since Pearl Harbor, and Japan's industry was simply not enough to cover the requirements for both replacement aircraft and spares. Wear and tear on the airframes had begun to show, and accidents or failures had become more frequent. The same issue was also apparent with pilots. The rigorous standards for Japanese naval aviators ensured their quality, but it also meant that casualties were expensive. Losses had been kept light relative to the damage that they had inflicted, but each lost pilot was far more devastating when compared with Allied aviation units. As such, Kido Butai was under strength. Not by a critical amount, but under strength nonetheless. And the pilots, while being the best in the business, were reaching the end of their tether. Even so, Kido Butai was ready for action. This would be the battle which they would crush the Americans and set the stage for final victory. As if to symbolise this point, following on behind them was none other than Admiral Yamamoto himself, with the main Japanese surface fleet and the invasion force. The entire Congo class of battle cruisers was present, as was Mutsu and Nagato. Atago, Miyoko and Chokai formed part of the cruiser escort, as well as the entire Mogami class, Mogami, Suzuya, Kumano and Mikuma. Alongside them were the lighter cruisers, Nagara and Sendai. And that isn't even the full list, I'm just going off the ships that appear in Azure Lane, there is still more in the order of battle. And speaking of huge orders of battle, here's the list of destroyers. The destroyer escort was numerous and formidable. Their ranks included, but aren't limited to, Ayanami, Fubuki, Uranami, Urakaze, Tanekaze, Isokaze, Hamakaze, Yukikaze, Kagoro, Kuroshio, Oyashio, Arashio, and Asashio. The rest of the Japanese ships could be found up north during the concurrent attack on the Aleutians, which I will cover another time when I talk about one of the participants. Probably Takao, because I really want to talk about Takao, but that's another time. But of course, this fleet would not be complete without the lady who has yet to make an appearance in game, but is famous in both history and anime alike. The flagship of the Japanese Navy. The Pride of Nihon. The ancient name for which Japan is known. Had to get that one in there, guys, come on. The plan to take Midway, while complicated, was simple in concept. It had a lot of moving parts, which required an exact sequence of events to occur. By June 4th, they would be in position to strike the island. A large-scale deck load strike would wipe out the enemy aircraft on the ground while hammering ground positions. Once the aircraft return, they would be rearmed for anti-ship operations as the invasion force moves in. Shore bombardment would commence, followed by the naval landing troops, with the light carrier Zuiho providing close air support. Once the island is attacked, the Americans would move to reinforce or retake the island as soon as possible. They would be spotted and attrited by the submarine screening force, picking off ships as they could while maintaining contact. This would be followed by a maximum effort attack by Kido Butai. With the American carriers destroyed and their retreat cut off by both aircraft and the submarine force, 
the Japanese surface fleet under Admiral Yamamoto himself would close with, engage, and destroy the remaining American ships with overwhelming force. The Americans, without their battleships, would be incinerated by the combined might of the largest single surface battle group in the world. However, due to the doctrinal and bureaucratic nature of Japanese planning, any variables in this sequence of events had no real contingency. Even so, Yamamoto kept a substantial reserve and trusted his tactical commanders to be both flexible and aggressive. Unfortunately, between him and his tactical commanders and frontline captains was Admiral Chuichi Nagumo. But given his victories in recent months, perhaps this wouldn't be a problem. Thus, the Japanese began the operation. And from the outset, things did not go as expected. Due to delays in setting off, the submarine recon screen did not get into position on time. The H-8K Emily seaplanes, meanwhile, were limited from operating, as the main atoll they used for staging Eastern Pacific scouting operations was now being used as an anchorage by a group of US Navy destroyers, as they had previously launched a raid from that location a few months earlier. There was also reports from the submarine force, as well as intelligence assets off Hawaii, that there was a distinct increase in radio traffic from US submarine forces and escort vessels. Ships that would often be used to support carrier operations. Something was odd. Yamamoto knew that the signals sent to him about all this information would have also been received and decoded on Akagi, and expected Nagamo to act accordingly. Tamon Yamaguchi, meanwhile, aboard Hiryu, ordered his torpedo bombers to undergo an extra round of readiness checks. His instincts, too, were telling him something was off. But with radio silence in effect and the plan underway, there wasn't much he could do but prepare for the mission ahead. Their anti-ship reserve was in place in case the Americans appeared. All he had to do was ensure that Hiryu did her part. As the sun rose on June the 3rd, 1942, all appeared to be going to plan. Sure, there were some setbacks in the reconnaissance side of things, but Kida Butai was almost in range of Midway, and the invasion fleet was making good time. But then, at 9am, the lookouts reported an aircraft to the east. A PBY Catalina had spotted the invasion force, and radioed its position. Several hours later, a formation of B-17s attacked the fleet, causing no damage. While a PBY Catalina achieved some success, torpedoing the fleet oil resupply ship Akebana Maru. Yamamoto reviewed the situation. The Americans had detected the transports, but not his combat units. In a weird way, this was kind of good news, as it meant that attacks would be directed towards the invasion force and not his carriers, and if they did attack, it would give his carriers time to catch them rearming. It didn't matter so much that they had been spotted the day early, in fact, it may even be better, considering it would achieve the objective of drawing the Americans to battle while Kido Butai had more fuel and munitions available. And with his submarine screen in position, as long as Nagumo was maintaining a constant air patrol, any approaching force would be seen. Spoiler alert, he wasn't. Although in fairness, that wasn't completely his fault due to the fact that the entire fleet had been sortied across two major operations simultaneously. A large contingent of the search aircraft that he would normally have with him was supporting the main battle fleet to his rear, and hence he needed to increase sorties of his existing force, which increased the risk of detection, as well as stretched his pilots and aircraft harder than he would normally be required to do so. That said, he still had a substantial force available, and yet again... Due to his cautious nature, his recon force hadn't been expanded and they were operating at normal pace, meaning his situational awareness was, like the earlier battle in the Indian Ocean, very lacking. Combine this with the long-range seaplanes being unable to get eyes on Pearl Harbor or the Hawaiian Islands, and the submarines being late to their patrol stations, he had no idea what was further than maybe 50 miles away from him in any direction. However, in his mind, this was of a secondary concern. The primary concern was eliminating the defences on Midway Island. At 4.30am on June 4th, 1942, Akagi's airgroove took off, 
with the rest of Kido Butai forming up behind them. As the senior officer airborne due to Akagi's commander of the air group, Fushida, being unable to fly because of medical issues, Hiryu's air group commander, Joichi Tomonaga, assumed the lead of the attack. Their target was Midway Island's air bases and beach defences. With their destruction, the invasion force will be able to land safely and secure their objectives. The Japanese formation was a full deckload strike of 108 aircraft, relying on weight of fire and surprise to inflict maximum damage. They proceeded towards the island at maximum crews, psyching themselves up for action. When in the distance, the fighter escorts spotted something. A large two-engine seaplane, diving for the deck away from them. A PBY Catalina. The US Navy. The lead zero rocked his wings. Enemy spotted, and throttled up to gain height. At 6am the island came into view, and above it was a whole squadron of enemy fighters. The Japanese still had the height advantage, but even so, the Americans had a higher altitude than expected if they had only just been spotted or scrambled, even with radar. Didn't matter though. The Zeros punched tanks and dived into the attack. 26 American fighters, a mixture of 6 F4F Wildcats and 20 F2A Buffaloes, attacked the Japanese bomber force, scoring kills on four of the B5N level bombers. However, in launching their attack, they had flown straight under the guns of the Zeros. The US fighters were massacred. 13 Buffaloes and 2 Wildcats went down almost immediately in the first pass as a ferocious dogfight ensued pushing the fighters away from the main strike force. With their tails cleared, the bombers lined up on their targets. The flight lead of Hiryu's bombers began the attack at 6.20am, releasing his bombs and beginning to survey the scene. It was then his heart skipped a beat. Intelligence reports had said that Midway was reinforced. It was to be expected it was an American frontline base. But they were unaware, or at least supposedly unaware, of the pending attack. Endless care had been taken to ensure surprise. Their fleet had been dispersed until a week before the operation began. Radio silence was enforced. Spoiling attacks had been launched on the Aleutians and, of course, the Coral Sea incident. And yet the American fighters were airborne at their altitude. And now something even more unnerving met his eyes. The runways, taxiways and aprons of the main airfield were all completely empty. There were fuel bowsers and munitions carts for arming and refueling aircraft. They were on the tarmac, they were visible. The hangars were open and the machine shops were active, so it was obviously a heavily used base and the flak was heavy. But there was no signs of any aircraft themselves. There were no planes. It was almost as though the Americans must have been airborne. They launched at 4 o'clock in the morning. And this is a huge base for something like 60 aircraft. At least. It would have taken way too long to... The Americans knew we'd be here. They must have taken off before we had. Or at least just after we had. Before they'd even detected us. They knew we were coming. Which means... Oh, shit. The realization for the senior commanders would come an hour later. At 7.10 aboard Akagi, lookout sounded an air raid alarm. American aircraft were approaching. Nagamo immediately moved to observe. Six of the brand new American torpedo bombers, the TBF Avenger, were heading in to attack Kido Butai. It was Torpedo Squadron 8 from USS Hornet, who had been sent to Midway ahead of the carrier. At least it was a small component of them with the new aircraft. They were accompanied by four B-26 bombers from the United States Army Air Force permanently based at the island. The American pilots came in low, very low, lining up on the flagship Akagi. In doing so, however, they were flying directly into the envelope of both the main anti-aircraft screen and right underneath the combat air patrol. 
Five of the Avengers were shot down, as were two of the B-26s. However, the Japanese were not prepared for the ferocity of the attack. They came right in on them. Two of the B-26s lined up to attack Akagi after deploying their torpedoes. While being chased down by Zeros, the lead bomber's nose gunner began shooting up the deck of Akagi, killing two of the crew. The Zeros were unable to fire on him for fear of friendly fire, and as such he managed to get away. The second B-26 was not so lucky. Being set ablaze by one of the Zeros chasing him, given how the Japanese treated prisoners and the current circumstances, the pilot of this B-26 made a quick decision. He was going to make things count. And he was going to do what some people would consider quite an ironic thing. This B-26 attempted a kamikaze strike on Akagi. He nosed onto the bridge and bored in to make a successful ramming attack. However, due to enemy fire and the damage he had hit sustained, he couldn't maintain the correct angle and missed cartwheeling into the ocean, sending debris flying for hundreds of yards. He had missed Akagi's bridge, but only barely. Nagumo looked down on the aircraft as it went past. It was that close. The Japanese combat air patrol, satisfied with their handiwork, returned to their patrol height and resumed their visual, while the lookouts were now a bit more awake and a little on edge. Nagumo was decidedly unhappy. The Americans knew where his fleet was, and they had hit his flagship. They didn't hit it seriously, they only strafed the deck, but they may come a bit later with something heavier. And as if to punctuate his thoughts, the lookouts shouted another warning. A second wave of US aircraft were inbound, much bigger in size. 27 US Navy dive bombers, 16 SBDs and 11 SBU-2s, followed by a flight of 17 B-17s, all of them having been launched from Midway. Again, the Zeros engaged with ferocity, destroying eight of the SBDs and two of the SBU-2s. The attacks were successfully disrupted, and no damage was done. They were forced away. The B-17s, meanwhile, were bombing from altitude, and bombing ships from altitude is not very effective, and they unsurprisingly missed their target due to the carriers taking evasive action. At this point... Nagamo received reports from the attack on Midway Island. First wave ineffective, require re-attack to ensure landing success. The aircraft that had hit him must be Midway's air group. And it was, so he got that right. And if the base on Midway is still active, they can hit us again upon rearming. Nagamo made a split decision. The invasion must take priority as part of the plan. The Americans don't have a naval presence anywhere near us, they can't have, and the Midway Air Group has to go back and rearm. We can catch them on the ground if we hit them with a follow-on strike. However, doing so would violate Yamamoto's clear instructions that a reserve of anti-ship aircraft must be maintained in case of enemy naval presence. But the Americans can't possibly be here, as they would have only sailed from Pearl Harbor yesterday. Nagamo turned to his adjutant, and gave the order. Take the reserve force and switch them immediately to ground attack weapons. The crew knew that this was disobeying a standing order from the commander in chief, but Nagamo gave his orders and made the decision. Rearm the anti ship force for an attack on Midway Island. Just like in the Battle of the Indian Ocean, this would delay the launch window for Nagamo's force. But if he could recover his attackers during the changeover and then launch the second wave, he would be able to neutralize Midway on schedule. Half an hour ticked by. Feverish activity in the hangar deck. The aircraft were being rearmed at a lightning pace. Japanese crews were something awe-inspiring. You gotta give credit to them. Their turnaround time was truly remarkable. They were giving it their best. Launch and recovery times for Japanese carriers, as well as rearming speed, was one of, if not the fastest in naval aviation. But given how many aircraft Kiribati had that needed rearming, and the complex nature of switching live ordnance on existing aircraft racks, having to change their racks from torpedo racks to bomb racks, all the stuff they had to do, this process was a long one. Nevertheless, 
Things weren't looking so bad. And then an alarming report came in. Enemy submarine detected close. The submarine USS Nautilus had closed within range of the battleship Kitashima and engaged with her torpedoes. The attack was ineffective, but it forced the escort force to move after them. The destroyer Arashi broke formation and moved to pursue, depth charging her once in range. The dangerous dance of anti-submarine warfare began as Kido Butai took evasive action. Nautilus was successfully pinned down, but it meant Arashi got separated from the rest of the fleet. Nagamo broke out northeast to get away from the sub-threat, as well as preparing to recover the raid on Midway. And then came a message. A message that caused the blood to drain from all the senior officers' faces. One of the scouts from the cruiser Tone hastily radioed a contact report. The radio operator was working frantically. American fleet spotted northeast. The enemy is accompanied by what appears to be an aircraft carrier. At this point, what had become obvious to Hiryu's flight commander an hour ago was now a realization that dawned on every flag officer in the Japanese fleet. In the immortal words of another great admiral from the annals of history, It's a trap! Nagamo was now confronted with a horrific Catch-22. Disobeying Yamamoto's orders, he had rearmed for a follow-up strike on Midway, believing it impossible that the Americans had a carrier force nearby. What's worse, Tone had relayed the location and type of the ship. The carrier opposing them was none other than USS Yorktown. The Americans had somehow taken a ship that was nearly sunk no more than three weeks ago and returned it to combat. How had they done it? And more than that, why would you throw so many resources at such a heavily damaged ship so quickly? Well, why else? They knew we were coming. It was a trap. And they had walked headfirst into it. The combat air patrol was being renewed, and the strike from Midway inbound to return. If he was going to launch an attack, he would have to use the reserve and launch a rapid strike with the aircraft he could assemble before the Midway raid landed. If he didn't get the attack away in time, however, the returning force would run out of fuel and be forced to ditch. But there was one more problem. The bombers were now all equipped with HE ordnance for attacking ground targets. No armor-piercing bombs or torpedoes. If he attacked, his ordnance would be not be as effective otherwise. However, there was one man in Kido Butai who knew exactly what to do. Tamon Yamaguchi aboard Hiryu began aggressively signaling Akagi. Both the US and Japanese did not armor the flight decks of their aircraft carriers to any significant degree, and while Nagumo had ordered the removal of anti-shipping weapons in favor of regular bombs, the HE weapons could blast open carrier decks, rendering them unable to conduct flight operations. Yamaguchi knew for sure this had to be a trap. The Americans knew we were coming, and if we found their carriers where they were reported to be, they've either launched already or are launching right now. Yamaguchi advised Nagamo to get everything they had in reserve on st or on standby, including the Relief Combat Air Patrol, to assemble, launch, and immediately attack the US carrier force. They had a window to attack the Americans and wipe out their carriers. This was their chance. Given the situation, it would almost certainly be a case of mutually assured destruction. They must have launched already. But if we could wipe them out as well, and somehow weather the coming storm, they would have achieved their mission ahead of schedule. But it would involve making a rash decision, and making one right now. Nagamo froze. He delayed. His cautious and indecisive nature had finally caught up to him. He had to act on the spot. He had to seize the initiative. This was it. Their chance. Their window of opportunity to hit first. He still had his reserve. It just had HE ordnance on board. True. But that didn't matter. It could still do the damage necessary. It would put re his returning flight at risk. That's true too. But what good is it if they don't have a ship to land on anyway? Nagamo made his choice. He would go by the book. 
He ordered the ground crews to rearm back to torpedoes and armor piercing bombs. After having spent the past hour changing ordnance to ground attack weapons, he ordered the crews to change them back to anti ship. Yamaguchi looked out his window towards Akagi with an icy ball in his stomach. If the Americans had launched their attack, there was no way we could rearm in time. And what's worse, the recovery for the midway strike would have to occur during this rotation. The entire Japanese air wing, except for the combat air patrol, would be aboard ship or too low on fuel to divert. Their entire air wing, in enclosed hangars, with all the ordnance and fuel being changed, their fuel bowsers and bombs would be all over the hangar decks. It would be a death trap. But maybe it's just one carrier. Maybe it's just a small relief force here to delay them. No, this was a trap. The entire US Navy had to be here. He was sure of it. But he is an officer of the Japanese Navy. And he would do his duty. Tamon Yamaguchi offered a silent prayer to the gods and his ancestors. And followed orders. Hoping, maybe, maybe we'll get lucky. They wouldn't. At that moment, from several directions came what amounted to the entirety of the US Navy's torpedo squadrons. Torpedo 8 had lost its TBF Avengers, but the rest of the gang had now arrived in their Devastators, followed closely by Torpedo 6 and Torpedo 3. A total of 41 aircraft were now hurling themselves through the anti-aircraft screen. Their escorting fighters were too low on fuel and had to return to the carriers, meaning that this job was solely theirs. They began their runs and attacked Kido Butai by squadron. The Japanese combat air patrol descended upon them like angry hornets, tearing their formations apart. The survivors dropped their torpedoes, but American Mark 13s had a terrible reputation for not working. The torpedoes were either evaded, or if any hits were scored, they didn't explode simply shattering the torpedo on contact. The US Navy would never again suffer a worse day for their aviators. Of the 41 attackers launched against Kido Butai, 35 would be shot down, the rest heavily damaged. The Japanese officers aboard the ships of Kido Butai sighed a sigh of relief. However, due to the fact that the torpedo attacks are conducted at wave height, all of their zeros were now on the deck. It would take some time to reform at patrol altitude. Also, they had run into the strange problem of being too successful. Half the fighters needed to rearm and refuel, having used their fuel and their ammunition to mercilessly destroy all the incoming attacks they had faced so far. The combat air patrol, therefore, was now down to half strength and out of position. But after deflecting the American torpedo aircraft... They were pretty confident that the fleet was safe. Kido Butai recovered the Zeros that were out of ammo, as well as the Midway raid that had finally returned. The entire air group was now being turned around, although the torpedo attack had disturbed their evolution somewhat. Having just defeated that torpedo attack though, the situation as far as Nagamo was concerned was pretty perfect. All we have to do now is rearm the aircraft and launch a strike of our own. Admiral Nagamo was feeling more confident. However, Yamaguchi was still concerned. At that moment, the lookouts called out a friendly vessel approaching. Nagamo returned to the bridge and turned his binoculars to view the incoming ship. Arashi, having succeeded in forcing Nautilus away, was returning to the formation at flank speed. The added support was welcome news. However, shouts from the lookouts nearby dispelled that thought almost immediately. Nagamo looked again. Arashi's crew was running about frantically, their anti-aircraft guns blazing away furiously. His eyes scanned above, following the path of their fire to see what they were shooting at. And at that moment, all the dread he had ever felt in his life returned in an instant. 47 SBD Dauntless Dive Bombers were flying directly towards Kido Butai. The anti-aircraft gunners opened fire with everything they had 
sending a veritable hailstorm of fire at the oncoming aircraft. But they were high up and in a shallow descent, gaining speed. What's worse is that the main cruiser forces were supporting Yamamoto's battle fleet and the invasion operations of both Midway and the Aleutians. There weren't enough anti-aircraft guns, and of those he had, half of them were obscured by the superstructures or ineffective older models of gun. The ships immediately began evasive maneuvers, but they were weighed down by the fact that their entire air groups were below their decks. It was going to be up to the fighters to stop this assault. But they had all run out of ammo, or out of position due to intercepting the torpedo attack. The reinforcement combat air patrol would have launched, but they had to recover the midway force before they could, and that was disrupted when Torpedo 8 hit them. It was a trap. It was perfect timing. There was absolutely nothing they could do. They were powerless to stop what was coming. The senior officers of the mightiest naval air service in the world watched in growing horror as the Americans deployed their dive brakes and began arcing over towards them. Nagumo watched as a large formation of 20 or so SPDs descended on Kaga, while another large group headed to Soryu. It seemed that Akagi may escape the first wave, but at that moment, three of the American planes broke off and headed straight at him. Thundering detonations reverberated through the ship, as eyes turned to see Kaga being blasted into oblivion, as bomb after bomb from the attacking SPDs ripped her apart. But their attention was only grabbed for a brief moment, before they turned back to the three aircraft launching their attack. Akagi's gunners fired with everything they had, but only half the guns could fire, and even then, their rounds were dropping low due to the SPDs diving at such an acute angle. Akagi's commander of the air group, Mitsuo Fushida, who was on the bridge, recounted the event. The lookout screamed, Hell Divers! I looked up to see three black enemy planes plummeting towards our ship. Some of our machine guns fired a few frantic bursts at them, but it was too late. The plump silhouettes of the American Dauntless dive bombers quickly grew larger, and then a number of black objects suddenly floated eerily from their wings. The first bomb was released, but the lookout saw it going wide. That left two. The next bomb came down. That one looked like it was heading astern. It missed. That left one. The flight lead, Richard Halsey Best, the man who had stared at the raging inferno of Pearl Harbor all those months ago, gripped his bomb toggle and aimed for the most effective aim point, the large, square aft elevator. His approach was perfect, he couldn't miss. The bomb released, sailing through the air on its deadly mission. The bridge crew watched on. They knew. This was it. Their decks were filled with munitions, armed aircraft, and fuel. As the bomb fell, a single thought went through the minds of every man watching. A simple, agonizing certainty. Richard Beth's bomb detonated in the aft hangar deck, straight on top of an entire squadron of fully armed B-5Ns. The explosion tore through the ship, killing most of the men in the hangar bay almost immediately. The force of the blast ruptured the aviation fuel tanks, spilling flammable liquid throughout the ship, immediately ignited by the burning wrecks of Akagi's once proud air group. The CO2 fire suppression system had been wrecked by the explosion, and her crew were now frantically trying to fight the raging inferno with just hoses. At that moment, another thundering detonation could be heard nearby, as bombers from USS Yorktown released another hail of ordnance into Soryu, stopping her dead in her tracks. The catastrophe could not have been more complete. In the span of ten minutes, 
the mightiest air fleet the world had ever known, ceased to exist. The damage control teams fought valiantly, as hard as they could, but due to the design of the ship as a battle cruiser and the same issues shared with all Japanese carriers, the ruptured fuel tanks and the enclosed decks made firefighting near impossible without their fire suppression system, and that system was designed to fight hangar fires, not assist in damage control, as the bombs had ruptured the piping. Akagi was a doomed ship. Flooding the magazine did nothing to stop the blaze, as the ordnance and fuel aboard the aircraft cooked off, killing men and forcing damage control teams back. Nagumo transferred his flag to the cruiser Nagara, and the order was given. Accepting damage control teams, all men were to abandon ship. However, while the majority of the crew would get off Akagi, it was soon apparent that all the pilots and air crew were standing by their aircraft in readiness to sortie as soon as possible. Almost all of Akagi's air group, along with those of the other two crippled carriers, were dead. The Imperial Japanese Naval Air Service had lost half its force in the space of half an hour. As the Battle of Midway raged on around them, Akagi kept burning, and it became apparent to all that were present that their ship the mighty flagship of Kido Butai, the naval strike force that had routed the most powerful nation on Earth, was nothing more than a burning pile of scrap, aimlessly floundering in the desolation of the war-torn Pacific. After the battle had ended, Admiral Yamamoto was in the wake of what could possibly be considered the most decisive battle in modern naval history. Seeing his old command slowly dying in front of him, he gave one of the hardest orders of his life. I was once the captain of Akagi, and it is with heartfelt regret and sorrow that I must now order her to be sunk. The destroyer Arashi fired her torpedoes into Akagi's side. The mighty Red Castle finally fell sinking into the abyss. And she would lay there undiscovered and untouched for almost 80 years, until the archaeology and research vessel R.V. Petrel, at the behest of the U.S. Naval History and Heritage Command, discovered her on the seafloor, 18,000 feet below the waves. She was found standing upright on her keel, resting peacefully alone her hull mostly intact. The final resting place of Imperial Japanese Navy aircraft carrier, Akagi. And that's the end of our story today. But wait, what happened to Hiryu? What about the rest of the Battle of Midway? What about Yorktown? All the great history here, and you're going to leave it out? No, my friends, of course I'm not going to leave it out. If you want to hear the rest of the story, though, you're going to have to tune in next time. Because next time, we're going to talk about the ship responsible for the destruction of Kido Butai. The ship whose name has gone down in history as the very symbol of the United States Navy. She is the lone survivor. The Grey Ghost the most decorated ship in the history of naval warfare, the maiden of battle who stood alone against Imperial Japan. You all know her name. Her name is USS Enterprise. Enterprise. Engage!